Counter-Enlightenment Politics, Right and Left Collectivism After Rousseau, collectivist political thinking divided into left and right versions, both versions drawing inspiration from Rousseau. The story of the left version is the subject of Chapter 5, so my purpose in this chapter is to highlight developments in collectivist right thinking and to show that in its essentials, the collectivist right was pursuing the same broadly anti-liberal capitalist themes that the collectivist left was. What links the right and the left is a core set of themes. Anti-individualism, the need for strong government, the view that religion is a state matter, whether to promote or suppress it, the view that education is a process of socialization, ambivalence about science and technology, and strong themes of group conflict, violence, and war. Left and right have often divided bitterly over which themes have priority and how they should be applied. Yet for all of their differences, both the collectivist left and the collectivist right have consistently recognized a common enemy, liberal capitalism, with its individualism, its limited government, its separation of church and state, its fairly consistent view that education is not primarily a matter of political socialization, and its persistent Whiggish optimism about the prospects for peaceful trade and cooperation between members of all nations and groups. Rousseau, for example, is often seen as being a man of the left, and he has influenced generations of left thinkers. But he was also inspirational to Kant, Fichte, and Hegel, all men of the right. Fichte was in turn used regularly as a model for right thinkers. But he was also an inspiration for left socialists, such as Friedrich Ebert, president of the Weimar Republic after World War I. Hegel's legacy, as is well known, took both a right and a left form. While the details are messy, the broad point is clear. The collectivist right and the collectivist left are united in their major goals and in identifying their major opposition. None of these thinkers, for example, ever has a kind word for the politics of John Locke. In the 20th century, the same trend continued. Scholars debated whether George Sorrell is left or right. And that makes sense, given that he inspired and admired both Lenin and Mussolini. And to give just one more example, Heidegger and the thinkers of the Frankfurt School have much more in common politically than either does with, say, John Stuart Mill. This in turn explains why thinkers from Herbert Marcuse to Alexandra Koyeva to Maurice Merleau-Ponty all argued that Marx and Heidegger are compatible, but none ever dreamed of connecting either to Locke or Mill. The point will be that liberalism did not penetrate deeply into the main lines of political thinking in Germany. As was the case with metaphysics and epistemology, the most vigorous developments in social and political philosophy of the 19th and early 20th century occurred in Germany, and German socio-political philosophy was dominated by Kant, Fichte, Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche, and Heidegger. By the early 20th century, accordingly, the dominant issues for most continental political thinkers were not whether liberal capitalism was a viable option, but rather exactly when it would collapse, and whether right or left collectivism had a best claim to being the socialism of the future. The defeat of the collectivist right in World War II then meant that the left was on its own to carry the socialist mantle forward. Accordingly, when the left ran into its own major disasters as the 20th century progressed, understanding its fundamental commonality with the collectivist right helps to explain why, in its desperation, the left has often adopted fascistic tactics.